This is Bloomberg Crypto, a daily Bloomberg iHeart podcast. It's Tuesday, October 4th. I'm Anne Herrera, senior crypto editor for Bloomberg News, in today for Stacey Marie. For many of us, the pandemic has meant getting to know what it's like to work remotely, and in most cases, from home. But in crypto, remote working had already been the norm for some time, with many workers roaming the world all year round and logging in from dreamy locations like the sandy beaches of the Caribbean or the palm-lined promenades of Miami Beach. When crypto prices were high, these roving crypto workers enjoyed the benefits of being digital nomads, moving from country to country in an attempt to leave behind the stress, expense, and bustle that's often associated with large financial centers. But now that the crypto market isn't quite as sunny, many of these nomads have started trickling back to the financial hubs of the world. Today, I'm joined by Bloomberg reporter Taz Akhtar. It's also like communities that have been built all over, like for example, Miami, Estonia, Portugal. And Panther Protocol CEO Oliver Gale, Nothing will substitute for the human experience, so people need to come together. To hear more about the crypto nomad lifestyle and why, for the time being, he's trying to give it up. Hi, Oliver Taz. Thank you for joining me. Hello. So let's start. Taz, you want to tell us how you know Oliver, how you guys met and how he ended up being in one of our stories? Yeah, sure. So I met Ollie back in Miami in April 2019. So we met at a crypto dinner hosted by the Cardano founder, Charles Hoskinson. Um, back then we were actually in a bear market as well, right? Yeah. Well, I don't know what crypto was trading at, but it was like well into a bear market like we are now. Um, and yeah, so he told me about his exchange called Bit, which is headquartered in Barbados. And then we kept in touch via Instagram and here we are. Yeah, it was pretty, I guess it was pretty organic. But I think during that dinner, we mostly talked about travel, you know, chasing sunsets. And Ollie was showing me pictures of like Barbados and his lifestyle on the road. I was talking about Ibiza quite a bit. So we both kind of had a similar lifestyle, right? So Yeah. So Taz, what were you, you're a reporter now. What were you doing in, in Miami? I was covering a crypto conference. So a lot of my lifestyle involved like just chasing conferences and just being embedded with a crypto community, really. Um, Because you are a crypto nomad too, right? For our listeners, like they might not know this, but we have two crypto, two former crypto nomads. But I'm, I wouldn't say I'm well into the crypto industry. Like I don't hold crypto, I'm objective, right? So I was kind of like just getting a feel of what Miami's about. That's what a lot happens. And actually, um, Cerez was there as well, wasn't he? The Miami... Um, mayor, mayor. Sorry, the Miami uh, mayor. So he was. He did a, a, an opening note back in 2019. Yeah. You were. I mean, you were sitting at the right table. Yeah. You know, as a crypto journalist. Yeah. Because you know, when Charles walks, the ground shakes a little bit. Hmm. All right. So, Ali, tell us about yourself. Like, where you're from. Like, and how. And very. How you ended up here in London again, right? Because from Miami to where you were before, like. Yeah. Well. Some people say my accent is international and or is it Irish? I'm definitely not from Ireland. I'm from Barbados. And uh, I was born in England, but grew up in Barbados from an infant onwards. And my background in crypto, really, I set up the first Caribbean Bitcoin exchange and mining company. And then we just had huge problems with correspondent banks and regulators. And so we ended up partnering with the Eastern Caribbean government and did the first central bank digital currency and so that was early days 2013 to 2018 I was CFO and president and co-founder at that company and then I left and set up a venture studio and began incubating protocols I'm CEO of one called Panther Protocol now which is working to make everyone free by restoring privacy and rights to sovereignty and that company was formed during the pandemic and so We raised all the capital, assembled the team, began building the technology all remotely, and it was a joy. But I've been traveling since 2014, moving countries for businesses. 
So what is it like? Like, give us the sense there. You're like, how long do you stay in one place? Do you know where you're going to go next? Like, how do you pick the places? Is it where there's a conference where the sun is shining? Yeah, like stronger? it's definitely. I mean, those last two points are really important for me, at least. Like, where's the sun shining? Where's there a conference or, or business that can be done? I feel like at this day and time, you can do business remotely quite effectively. And so I can really operate, you know, we operate across almost all time zones as well, because it's not just one uh, company. There's a, a UK credit platform. There's a Gibraltar uh, protocol business. There's a Delaware protocol business. There's a Cayman fund. There's the Barbadian exchange. And so the team is all over the world. So wherever I am, I'm always in some some pockets time zone and we work asynchronous asynchronously a lot so emails and messenger platforms i think it's also important noting that oliver's lifestyle is quite common within the crypto industry so you're mm. going to find a lot of businesses are decentralized and there's also like communities that have been built all over like for example miami estonia portugal so tell us, why have you decided to kind of settle down and why London? And, you know, have you seen more crypto nomads move back to financial centers? Because I guess that's kind of the point of what we wrote is like there was lots of moving around, but like slowly as the centers reopen, more people are trickling back. Yeah. And people want to see each other in person, you know, so the waiting of in-person meetings has gone back up. In the pandemic, it was perfect. I loved it. Every 30 minutes, you have a different meeting with somebody. You really connect with them virtually. And you do whatever needs to be done because that's how you have to do it. Whereas now there's a discount on that. It's like, yeah, the virtual conference is great, but you know what's better? Looking someone in the eyes and shaking their hand. And since we can do it, we want to do it. And so that's my general observation. When I look at London itself though, um, London is a FinTech hub. Uh, it does have very good tax incentives for things like research and development. If you're building software, they have Good incentives for investors. European investors are are strong. British investors are strong. Not as strong as those in the US in terms of their risk appetite and check size. But uh, what you've got is a huge pool of talent. And from a lifestyle perspective, to me, London is it. I mean, the weather sure is not great, but I don't spend winter here. So it's like I'm, you know, getting on a plane any minute now. It's October coming up. I won't be here for October and I never will if I can avoid it unless I have to come for business. You ask like, what's it looked like? In the, I'd say in 2014, 2015, 2016, I was spending six months or so on average in a place. Now it's more like six days, maybe two weeks. And then I go wherever else. A lot of the time it's just synchronicity. You meet someone or see someone and you do business and they're like, hey, what are you doing next week? You should come so-and-so and speak or, ha or have a meeting or hang out. And so you do it. So how, how do you do that? I mean, I guess everybody's situation is different, but it seems quite expensive to move from one place to another because someone just invites you to a meeting or a conference in like Seoul. So how, how has that like the w crypto winter affected movement, you think? For you and for the community at large, are you seeing more people saying, I have to like tone it down? In the bull market, these conferences start to resemble a festival and everybody's quote unquote got it and they're, you know, sailing high. Then the bear market comes around and just like birds migrating in winter, all of the transient people disappear again and, and in the peak of a bear market, which we might not be in right now, uh, it, like it could go, could go a lot longer than this. Then you start to look around the room and you see the familiar faces. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, real OGs. That's what, like, that's what they call them in crypto. And so, yeah, I mean, it is expensive though. However, I've been in crypto a long time. So like there's multiple ways to look at it. One is I'm enjoying my life. The other is the impact that I have where I go exceeds the cost of what I'm doing. How much, you know, staying in a hotel or wherever. After the break, more from Panther Protocol CEO, Oliver Gale, about living the crypto nomad lifestyle and the lessons he's learned along the way. All my life I always been 
about my growth. In case you didn't know, Oliver is also a singer-songwriter. The music underneath us right now is Oliver's own song called Sail the Coast. So when you think about your time around the world, what were some of the lessons you learned or things that you think will stay with you as you remain in one place? Can you still be a nomad at heart, but like sleep in the same bed? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great place to look at it from. Really and truly, there's a level of letting go of the plan when you're living a nomadic lifestyle because it's very difficult to plan. And if you do, changing flights and accommodation all the time will be the inevitable outcome. So I think one of the big things for me is it's pulled me into a sense of sometimes not knowing where I'm going to be tomorrow. Like tomorrow is tomorrow's problem. So let's figure out what, whether it's what meetings I have, where I have to go, am I flying? You know, I'll, I'll figure, I'll be told I'm flying tomorrow. But really, like, I don't even make plans anymore. And so there's a beauty to that because it gives you a huge sense of freedom. I think the other side to that too is I occur in people's lives like an ephemeral figure. Oh, wow, oh my gosh, you're in LA? Yeah, oh, cool, you live here? No, I'm going to London, then I'm in London. Oh, you're in London? Do you live here? No, not right now. I'm going to Barbados. Oh, wow, you're back in Barbados now? Good to see you again. So you staying? No, I'm off to Colombia. That's literally the last, that's the two weeks of my life. That's the week that just passed and it's the next two weeks in front of me. So it's, it's great to form meaningful connections with people, whether they're personal or professional, but that's a challenge. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to actually grounding myself and building some more permanent community as well. And for me, big city like London, right next to Europe, different weather to the Caribbean so I can basically arbitrage the seasons. But as companies scale and the sector matures, you think more people will need to have bases and you'll need to coalesce around communities or not really? Like, is there a benefit? Like, as you said, you know, meeting people and shaking their hand. Do you need that with your colleagues at one point, right? Because people listening to this will have experience working from home and never seeing their colleagues for two years and maybe they're seeing them now and they're like, whoa, yeah, it's actually cool to like chat before work. Like, do you, do you need that to to scale a company or not really? I'm going to say it would definitely depend on the industry. In tech, I don't think so. I think cultural precedent was redefined during the pandemic and it's pretty clear that if you have the right communication tools, project management tools and accountable team, you really need, you need a team of people that do what they say they will do when they say they'll do it. Otherwise, distributed teams, remote teams don't work. So my experience of building teams of this nature is one bad apple can spoil the whole bunch because it's like a bad communication node in your network of people. They've got to go, you got to find the right people. A tech facilitates that because it's non-physical. That being said, nothing will substitute for the human experience. So people need to come together. I think working spaces are important workshops and team bonding sessions are important and also very difficult to coordinate. I've been trying to do it with Panther for like four months now, just to get people together, have some fun together. You know, it brings you together around the mission, the vision of your company. So I wouldn't, I'm not discounting it. And then it, as well, it depends on your position. So if you're the deal maker or responsible for bringing in capital one way or the other, Nothing's going to beat sitting down with someone and spending time, particularly if you do everything but talk about business. That's really helpful. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you, Taz. You can find more of Taz Akhtar's reporting on the Bloomberg Terminal on Bloomberg.com and on Twitter at Tanzeel underscore Akhtar. That's at T-A-N-Z-E-E-L underscore A-K-H-T-A-R. I'm Anne Herrera, in today for Stacey Marie Ishmael. On the next episode of Bloomberg Crypto, Adam Newman, known for founding WeWork and popularizing the idea of co-working spaces, as well as for extravagant and eccentric behavior, is back. And this time, there's a crypto angle. This is Bloomberg Crypto, a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. 
For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Send us your comments, questions, or suggestions for the show to crypto at Bloomberg.net. Or find us on Twitter, we're at Crypto. The supervising producer of Bloomberg Crypto is Vicky Vergolina. Our senior producer is Janet Babin. Our producer is Mohammed Farouk. Associate producer is Moses Andam. Desta Wonderad is our engineer. Original music by Leo Sidron. I'm Stacey Marie Ishmael. We'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> 